thank you all for coming tonight. Um, my name is Amy Nelson. I'm the Director of Planning and Economic Development for the City of Burlington. And I want to introduce Mark Kirchner. He is the Director of Planning with PARC. Um, before that, he spent 19 years with Guilford County in planning, community development, and transportation. The past two and a half years, Mark has been the Project Manager for Piedmont Together. And it's in that capacity that he's here with us tonight. Thank you, Amy. Welcome. 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 How is everyone? Great. Well, thank you. Good. We are very excited that you're able to be here tonight. My first polling question is, how many of you all have heard of Piedmont Together before? Okay. A smattering of hands across the room. That's fine. Now, let me ask the question again. How many of you all have heard of Piedmont Together before? Well, everyone should raise your hand. And that's one of the great reasons that I love coming out and talking about the project, because every time we get exposed, people a little bit more to what Piedmont Together about is about. I could spend the next hour and a half talking about the project, but that's not really why we're here tonight. Although Piedmont Together is a 12-county effort, we've been about two and a half years uh, into this project. Uh, it does include Burlington and Alamance, and there's been good participation by folks here in Alamance County. We've had a couple of civic forums uh, related to our events. And the end goal is to come up with some recommendations for things that we can do as a region to make ourselves more economically resilient. And that's kind of the, the basic premise. And we hope to be able to accomplish that by making every city and town within the region as strong as it can be. Because if we think of the region as a puzzle, if any one of those puzzle pieces falls off, loses its color, then the puzzle is not as pretty as it should be, not as strong as it should be. So while it is a regional project, it is really about making each city and town as strong as it can be. And one of the ways that we're doing that is while we're here tonight, if you're going to hear from these two gentlemen, which I'll introduce in a second, the other thing that I want to point out to sort of drive home this point is another thing that we've been able to do with the project is that we've gone into five communities across the region, and I have examples here of the reports from Maydan and Elkin that we did a two or three day charrette in, and it was about trying to energize those cities, or those towns, should I say, into doing something to improve the quality of life within their community. I'm excited that we're here tonight because y'all already have that energy that is building uh, within your downtown area. If you like what you hear tonight, I've got some flyers about where these gentlemen will be speaking the rest of the week. Uh, they'll be in High Point and Winston-Salem uh, tomorrow. Uh, we'll be in Lexington uh, Wednesday night and then Greensboro Thursday night. So, um, with that, let me give a brief introduction for for those of you in, in the planning field, um, you know, sometimes you, there are rock stars that kind of creep up and then these, these guys are, you know, whether they're guys or gals, they're just really wanted by everyone to come into their communities. And these two gentlemen are two of those. I've heard both of them speak. I think you're going to be in for a real treat. I think it's going to be different than what you've perhaps heard in the past. But one of the beauties about what they have to say is that it is backed up by facts and numbers and figures. It's not just some planners sort of speaking about some utopia that we want to try to create here. It's really based upon a lot of facts. Joe Minicosi, uh, well, let me introduce Chuck um, Run folks, because Chuck's going to talk first. Uh, Chuck is a professional engineer as well as a certified planner. Um, and he has his BA in engineering from the University of Minnesota Institute of Technology and an MA in urban and regional planning um, from the Minnesota's Humphrey Institute and is recently the author of this book called Thoughts on Small Towns. Um, Joe Minicosi is a principal with Urban 3, which is an actual based consulting company specializing in land value economics, property tax analysis, and community design. His work has been featured at the Congress of New Urbanism, uh, the APA, and the International Association of Accessor Officers and Partners for um, New Growth. So with that, I'm just going to turn the program over to Chuck and Chuck. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, was, I was just thinking, uh, I was asked 
to come and speak in Mississippi. In, uh, and, and we were trying to work out a date, and they said August. And I'm like, there's no way. I'm going from Minnesota to Mississippi in August. And I got here today, and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's hot here. <laughs> so I suppose it's not that hot for all of you, but coming from Minnesota, um, it's a little bit warm. Thank you uh, very much for coming out tonight, uh, for inviting me to be here. Uh, my background in engineering and planning kind of has put me in a very uh, different position uh, where I've kind of become, for many years, was the lone voice on projects and things that were coming up through the governments that I worked for. A few years ago, I started a blog uh, called the Strong Towns Blog, and that grew into a nonprofit organization, and I've spent the better part of the last two years now going around and working with communities around the country on issues of finance and really where the standard kind of engineering, planning, economic development formula meets local finance. And so what we're going to go through tonight a little bit, and then I'm going to turn it over to Joe, uh, is some of the things that have developed um, that will look very familiar to you. Uh, a little bit about our organization. Uh, we're a nonprofit. Uh, we work nationally. Our mission is to support a model of growth that allows America's towns have become financially strong and resilient. As I talk, I will talk about towns, I'll talk about cities. Uh, we're really discussing whether it's towns or cities or hamlets or counties or you know whatever it is the local unit of government. If we had named our organization Strong Local Units of Government, it would be a really long web address. Uh, it would not kind of be as catchy. So we call ourselves Strong Towns, we're really talking about our the base unit of government that we operate our, our places. There's an umbrella that I want to kind of preface our whole conversation with, and, and that is to look at our historical development pattern. There's a, a very comfortable narrative about the places we live and the way we build them. Uh, and it's a narrative of progress. This is uh, ancient Ur. This is the oldest human settlement that we've excavated. It's in the Fertile Crescent. This is and artist rendering, obviously you can have photos of ancient Ur. Uh, ancient Rome, again, an artist rendering. Uh, we look at these places and you know, we see their layout and their design and we, we understand that this was a design of a certain time, a certain era, a, a time when people got around primarily by walking. And so when we look at the scale of places, we look at the distance between buildings, we look at the distance between places where people worked and places where people shopped and, and all that, uh, it has a very familiar uh, ring to it. This is my hometown in central Minnesota, back from the early 1900s. And this, this city, you know, similar kind of layout design, there was a railroad stop about a block off of here. Uh, but the city itself had very similar kind of patterns, very similar characteristics, because largely everybody that got around the city walked. Of course, after World War II, and really beginning a little before World War II, but then kind of stalled by the depression and the war. Uh, but largely beginning after World War II, we started to build places differently. Uh, we started to scale things around. The new technology of the day, the automobile, we came up with different ways of building homes, different ways of building businesses, different ways of connecting places. Uh, our city started to change in their shape and in their form. As an engineer, we're taught in engineering school, and as a planner, we're taught in planning school, that this represents just a natural progression of humanity. We used to walk, we built cities one way, now we drive, we build cities another way. At some point, we'll uh, have jet cars, and we'll build cities a different way, and then at some point, we'll have teleportation, and we'll build cities a totally different way. That's a very comforting narrative to us, because it's a narrative of progress, and we like to think of ourselves as being in this kind of natural progression of humanity improving itself. There's another way to look at this, though, and this is the way I want you to kind of think this through as we go through and look at some of the numbers we've got to present tonight. Uh, and that is that this represents, when, when you look at this style of development, what you're seeing here, by the time we get to 1900, is the culmination of thousands and thousands of years of knowledge gained through trial and error. People trying different things, seeing what worked, adapting what worked in the neighboring city to their city, a different climate, a different place, and the transmission of knowledge essentially by trial and error. What we see when we look at these types of layouts is a body of knowledge based off of theory 
and based off of a very young practice of how to do things. Traffic engineering as a profession is literally 60 years old. It is a very, very young profession. Uh, you know, the idea of zoning and Euclidean-based zoning and separation of uses is a very, very young concept, particularly when compared to the thousands and thousands of years of human history we have in building places. It's important as we start to take a critical examination of where we're at today, America 2013, that we understand that the way we live, the way we design our places, is a large experiment. It is a social experiment, it is a cultural experiment, and it is a financial experiment in how to bring about prosperity. So, when we look at that experiment, one of the things we see is that the way we finance it uh, is a radical departure from the way uh, historically we finance growth at the local level. If you went back 100 years and you looked at the economy of Burlington, uh, you would find that if we were going to create jobs or growth or economic development here, that was going to come from us. We were going to do that here locally. Uh, if we weren't going to collectively pool our resources or if we weren't going to find a way to do it, it wasn't going to happen. Through the Depression and being really codified after World War II, uh, three primary mechanisms of growth and development at the local level uh, became part of how we do business. The first are transfer payments between governments. This is the idea that the state and the federal government have a role in growing uh, local communities. This may be through a, a grant to help put in a sewer system uh, or some type of low interest loan to help build a community center or what have you. The second mechanism is transportation spending. This is the idea that if we could spend on transportation, uh, you know, collect federal tax dollars or gas tax dollars federally, collect them at the state level, allocate them down to projects that would impact uh, local uh, growth and development, that we could create jobs and we could induce growth at the local level. The third is debt. Certainly cities have taken on debt in order to create growth. Uh, back in 1950, the average city spent 2% of its budget on debt service. Today that number is 18% and it's climbing. Uh, but even more importantly than public debt is private sector debt. The idea that uh, if we could create uh, mechanisms for people to get long-term mortgages, uh, to lower their monthly payments, uh, to get in with less financing, if we could subsidize mortgage interest, and, and, and you know all the things that we do to try to create induce growth, uh, we could encourage people to take on debt and to grow the economy. These three mechanisms have combined now post-World War II to be the primary way we create growth at the local level, which of course increases our tax revenue. If you look at these transactions, if you look at the way we create and induce growth at the local level, there's some very powerful incentives uh, for us to look at the current system in a positive way. When the federal government comes in and you know, give some type of grant or, or subsidized loan or, or ongoing subsidy. When the DOT comes in and does some type of transportation investment, or when a developer comes in and makes an investment in the community and people come in and get commercial real estate loans and mortgages after the fact, uh, what you have is a transaction that at the local level costs us very little. As taxpayers, we generally don't pay a lot for those transactions. But the tax revenue, the tax base that create, is created is substantial. So we see, with very little expense, a big expansion of our, of our overall tax revenue stream. The catch is that the public agrees to maintain those improvements forever. We not only agree to provide police and fire protection and all the services that are needed, but we agree to maintain that street, that sewer pipe, uh, that new park, whatever it is, long, long into the future. If you think this out over multiple life cycles, in other words, if you step back and look at this as a long-term proposition, there's only one of two ways that this makes any sense. Either growth is going to continue at ever-accelerating rates. In other words, we're always going to be able to bring in a whole bunch of new development that has no upfront cost for us, but all kinds of revenue. And we can use that revenue to make good on all the obligations we've assumed over the years. Or the pattern of development, the way we actually build our places, is going to generate more revenue than it generates in long-term costs. Now, there were parts of this country, and I don't think you know here as much, although to a degree, uh, where it felt for a while like number one was true, that we could actually grow 
exponentially accelerating forever. I think we all now realize today that that's just not the case. Unfortunately, number two is also not true. And this is where, for a, a very brief period of time, this will get a touch technical. If I, if I go too fast or something doesn't make sense, raise your hand and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll slow down. I'm obsessive about models uh, and very kind of clean, real world examples. Uh, I don't like looking at theoretical numbers. Uh, I kind of hunt for um, real projects out in the world that don't have a lot of background noise to them. This is probably the most simple project you'll find. This is a rural subdivision. These are two and a half acre lots, the kind of thing you find on the far edge of a, of a city. Uh, the only infrastructure here is a dead end road with a cul-de-sac. So very, very simple uh, construct. Um, if you look at this, the city's policy was that all roads in the city should be paved. And so the city went out and paved this road. The city paid half the cost, and the property owners paid the other half. The cost was $6,600. We asked the question, OK, the only people utilizing this road are the people that live there. It's not been widened for through traffic. There's no chance that it's ever extended. There's no commercial traffic. It's just a simple residential property. Uh, series of residential lots. How long, based on the taxes the city is collecting from the people in here, will it take the city to recoup the money they just spent building that road? The answer is 37 years. Now, that is only for half the cost. It's property owners pay the other half. That road's not going to last anywhere near 37 years, yet it's going to take the city 37 years just to recoup what they spent building that road. This would be a uh, slightly more urban development. This is a, uh, these are half acre, three quarter acre lots. You can see these over here on the west side are a little bit bigger, but they have a limited amount of frontage. Again, like the last one, these are very simple. Uh, it's a closed loop system with a dead end cul-de-sac. There's no through traffic, there's no commercial traffic. This is just residential properties. Uh, this was built in the early 1980s. Uh, it had completely fallen apart, and the city had to go out and fix it. The cost was $354,000. We asked the question, based on the taxes being collected from the people that live within this development, how long is it going to take the city to recoup what they just spent to fix the road? And the answer is 79 years. We then asked the question, OK, <coughs> let's pretend the city wanted to collect enough money from these residents to fix their road between now and the time the road fell apart again. What would that mean? It would mean they would need to increase taxes immediately by 46%, and then annually increase them by 3% over inflation every year for the next 25 years, with all that extra revenue just going to maintain the road. Now, I found, I've got like dozens of these examples. I used to go through them and just beat people over the head to show you again and again and again. I found that I can just cut it off at two and then show you one more, that would be good. If you want me to go on infinitum, I can. But uh, we've got a number of them on our website. You can go and look at these case studies we put up there, where we've looked at these numbers. But I'll show you uh, this one. This is a uh, business park. Um, this is kind of the most intense type of commercial development that we generally <coughs> see. Uh, the city went in the early, or the mid-1990s and built this business park. It's got the wide industrial size roads, the thick pavement, the, the curb and gutter, uh, all the sewer and water and storm sewer, all the utilities that you would have. Uh, this park is completely built out. Every lot is now occupied. And the city said, this is such a successful project, we're going to repeat it and do it again. Uh, you know, commercial is where we make all our money. OK, Chuck, maybe we lose money on residential, but we make it up on commercial, right? Um, in today's dollars, if they were going to redo this project. They actually own the land right next to us, so they're just going to repeat, basically build the same thing again. In today's dollars, it would be 2.1 million. Uh, we can actually look and see exactly what was built. There's 6.6 .6 million dollars of private sector investment that's been made up there. Now, before we go any further, of that 6.6 .6 million, it's not all private sector. Um, four of those lots are in church. Uh, churches are very important, but the church is not paying any taxes to the city. Uh, two of the lots are a school bus maintenance facility. Again, school district is a very important part of the community, but they're not paying any taxes to the city. Uh, one of the lots is a county maintenance garage. One of the lots is a city maintenance garage. So of the remaining lots, the ones that theoretically pay taxes, uh, to the city, 
Every single one of them was either given away for a dollar and or received a long-term tax subsidy in order to encourage that business to move to the, this park. We assumed that the entire new park would build up within 12 months, every single lot would be occupied by a tax-paying entity, and that none of them would receive any subsidies. If that took place, kind of the most wildly optimistic scenario imaginable, it would still take almost three decades, 29 years, for the city to break even on this development. And that would be 29 years, three decades, with every penny of revenue going just to service that debt. In other words, everybody else's taxes in town would need to go up in order to pay, to maintain uh, you know, everything in there to provide police protection and fire protection and all the other services that would be needed in <coughs> the park. Because in the most wildly optimistic scenario, it takes three decades for them to just break even. <clears throat> Here's what's going on. Think of a developer coming to town to build a new development. Not asking for any subsidies, not asking for any variances from your code, willing to build everything exactly as you're asking for. Uh, and then once the homes are built, once the commercial properties are built, uh, what they're gonna do is they're going to then turn it over to the city, donate that infrastructure to the city to maintain it. This is a transaction that every city in the country would you come in and build it all, it doesn't cost us anything. We get all that new tax base, we'll take over the maintenance. This is a, a transaction everybody does. But let's say that we decided, as part of this transaction, that we're gonna take the money that would normally go towards maintaining all this stuff, and we're gonna set that aside, and we're gonna allow it to grow every year. And then, in the future, when we have to go out and actually make good on this promise to, to, to maintain all this stuff, we'll go take the money out of that account and go do it. Here's what would happen. In the first year, uh, you would have a new tax base, you would have new revenue coming in, but of course everything is brand new, so you would have no money going out at all. In the second year, you'd have more money coming in, so you would add to what you had from the first. In the third year, you'd have more money coming in, and fourth, and every year you would add to what you had, so as you went on and on and on and got out in a couple decades, you would have this huge pile of money. Remember, the infrastructure is all relatively new, you're not having to pay for any of it at this point. But here, in year 25, when we actually have to go out and fix something, what we find is that the cumulative amount of money that we brought in up to that point is insufficient. And from a cash flow standpoint, we go far into the negative. Now, a city is not one with development. A city is many developments. Let's say that our developer comes in uh, two years after that first development and says, you know, that was so successful for me, uh, and it was so successful for you as a city, I would like to do that again. And two years later, comes in and does another one, and two years after that, another one. So this is a scenario where we have nice, steady growth. We have new developments coming in all the time. We have nice, steady growth. And we take that money that would go to maintenance, and we set it aside, and we save it for the day in the future when we have to make good on our promise to maintain everything, right? What would happen is, in year one, you'd have the first development. You would start accumulating money with that. In year three, another development would come online. You'd start adding to that year five, year seven, year nine, and you can see, as we go out further and further, our revenue starts to actually accelerate upwards. All the new developments coming in, coming online, start to cumulatively add to our revenue. Uh, and we have all this money in the bank. And when we have to make good on that promise we made in year one, it's not a big deal. You know, we've got the money. Uh, we can do that, it's okay. New growth creates what we call the illusion of wealth. Because, of course, we understand that if we ultimately lose money on every transaction, we don't make it up in volume. If every time we do a development, it costs us over the long run more than we're cumulatively bringing in, the further you go out into the event horizon, the more downward pressure there is on the budget. It makes us feel wealthy right off the bat, but long term, it creates this enormous set of liabilities that we're now having to deal with. Now, I get to this point of the presentation, and I've had people stand up and say, well, Chuck, we started out talking about this as this you know, new experiment we were doing, started post-World War II. I'm looking at what you're showing us here. We should have gotten broke a long time ago. Uh, you know, why haven't we? Uh, and the reality is, is we dealt with this in a, in a, in a, in a way that's going to be familiar to all of you. Um, this is a graph of debt. Now, we're all familiar with the narrative of our public debt, right? Our public debt is enormous. 
trillions of dollars, this unfathomable sum of money. Uh, if you look at this graph here, the bottom line, the blue one, is our public sector debt. That's that unfathomable huge number. The black one is our GDP. This green right here, the one that soars up like that, that's our private sector debt. That's debt that you and I have. That's home mortgages, commercial real estate loans, credit cards, auto loans, uh, margin interest accounts, student loans. The way we finance the first generation of this experiment is by using our savings and then reinvesting this illusion of wealth, the cash that we got uh, from the early stages of this development path. The way we sustained it over a second life cycle is by gradually switching from an economy based on savings and investment to an economy based on growth through debt accumulation. Debt accumulation became so important to keeping our economy going that as we crossed over into the third life cycle here, we actually allowed it to become predatory. We actually allowed mechanisms to become part of the way we do business that encouraged people who couldn't afford homes to buy homes, people who could afford small homes to buy large homes, people who could afford large homes to buy multiple large homes. Our capacity to continue this experiment further through debt accumulation is just not there. And so obviously there's some serious implications. The mechanisms of growth we become accustomed to are waning. The federal government and the state governments do not have the capacity. Uh, they have, they've they've <coughs> over-obligated themselves and are underfunded to meet all their obligations. They do not have the capacity to invest in local cities in order to allow us to maintain all the stuff that we committed to maintain. Uh, the DOTs are functionally broke. Uh, if you look at your DOT, it's no different than any other state. Uh, literally 25, 35 cents on the dollar long term of revenue for every dollar of committed maintenance that they have in terms of outlays. Uh, this is something we see everywhere across the country. And of course the private sector is completely capped out and their capacity to continue to take on more debt in order to fuel more and more and more growth. This means that local governments are going to be forced to absorb the cost of the current development pattern. If we want that road fixed, we're going to have to pay for that. If we want that pipe repaired, that's going to come from us. If we want to build that new park or that new community center or that new library, we're going to have to collectively pool our resources to make that happen. The money's not going to come from outside the community. None of this can happen in the current pattern of development without some large tax increases and or large cuts in services. Now, Joe and I weren't invited here to tell you what you already know, right? Everybody uh, at every level of government is dealing with you know, these two variables today. How big is the tax increase going to be? Who's going to pay for it? How deep is the service cut going to be, and where is that cut going to be felt? It is absolutely critical at the local level that we see the third variable in that sentence. The third variable being the current pattern of development. As long as we continue to build places that are functionally insolvent, there is no way that our cities can avoid going bankrupt. As long as we continue to build places that cost us more over the long term, than the cubits that we bring in in revenue. There is no amount of tax increase and there's no amount of service cut that can make up for that insolvency. We literally need to change the way we are building our places. So what does this look like? And I had to, I had to put this in um, because there is this kind of sense uh, that you know there's a, there's, a, there's a rabbit we can pull out of the hat here and say, well, here's how we fix this. Here's like the you know, the, the one easy thing we can do, uh, we're kind of conditioned to look for that. In fact, uh, in giving these talks across the country, I would, I would, in the very early days, have people stand up and say, at the very end, well, Chuck, you, you've laid out this thing and you've talked about a lot of stuff here, but you haven't told us the solution. What's the solution to these problems? And I finally, you know, was getting frustrated and I, I realized that what I was being asked was not exactly what I was hearing. What I was hearing was, you know, what's the solution? But what I was really being asked was, what can someone else change about what they're doing so that I don't have to change anything about what I'm doing? I don't know of any such solution, and Joe doesn't know of any such solution. We're not here to offer that up at all. What we're here to talk about are 
uh, not only identify this kind of critical problem that we're dealing with, this complex set of circumstances that we've created, but start to talk about how do we as rational, intelligent people have a conversation and start to come up with responses to this set of problems that we have. So before Joe gets into some of the productivity stuff, which I think is the, the ultimate key, uh, I'd like to offer a few things that we can look at. And I always like to start with this photo. Uh, again, this is my hometown back in the early 1900s. Now, it took me almost three hours to drive to Minneapolis-St. Paul today, uh, other north of Minneapolis-St. Paul. Uh, some people today call it the middle of nowhere. Back then, it was absolutely the middle of nowhere, okay? Um, these were a bunch of illiterate, you know, uneducated lumberjacks out in the middle of the forest in northern Minnesota. Uh, yet, stand back and look at the place they built. You know, as a, as a planner, as an engineer, I look at this, and this is just spectacular. You know, the, the spacing of the buildings, the segmentation of the space, the, the beautiful symmetry of these buildings, the way they frame the public realm, the, the, the whole thing is just spectacular, it's just fantastic. Let me ask you some questions about this place. How thick was their zoning code? How many, you know, uh, boards and commissions did you have to go through to get a permit to build something here? How much subsidy did they give out to attract people to this community? They didn't even have 30-year mortgages. I mean, literally, uh, you know, they, they didn't have any of the mechanisms that we use today, that we rely on, uh, that we think are responsible for, you know, growth and development and prosperity. How did they know how to do this? Again, they didn't have engineers, they didn't have planners, they didn't have architects. These were literally a bunch of lumberjacks in the middle of nowhere. How did they know how to build a city this night? It's really easy. They just copied what they knew worked. <clears throat> they literally took the cultural knowledge they had on how to build places, how they had seen it done in other places across, you know, wherever they went across the world, because this is how people build places for thousands of years, and they literally applied that knowledge. That's knowledge that we've lost. We have a new set of cultural knowledge today on how to build places based on 60 years of a different approach, a different path. Yet, these people here didn't need codes, didn't need standards, didn't need you know, anything that we use today to build places that were financially strong and financially resilient. The technology is there. The understanding is there. Uh, we just literally have to recapture it and, and study it and understand uh, why these people inherently built this way. And a lot of it is because this is how you build places that were financially viable. This is what the same street looks like today. And if you want to understand in one slide why we are going broke as a country, there's a half million dollars of public investment here in the infrastructure in that street. And look at the return on that investment. What's the tax revenue stream that we get back for that half million dollars of investment? It's nothing. There's literally a bunch of parking lots and some half-abandoned buildings. It's hardly anything at all. You cannot maintain a half million dollars of public infrastructure on no revenue. Yet, every city, I, we were driving around Burlington today, we have miles and miles of stuff that is as productive or less than that. We cannot afford unproductive places. So, let me give you a couple of things and then I'm going to turn it over to Joe. Uh, one of the things that I see all over the place, uh, and this is a very kind of late stage, we call this the desperation phase of the suburban experiment, mm -hmm. is this idea of build it and they will come. Build and they will come is a great movie plot, right? Baseball, Iowa, cornfields. It's a horrible economic development strategy. And cities all over this country, desperate for growth, desperate for that next kick that will allow them to balance their budget next year, are doing all kinds of crazy, crazy things to induce, to induce growth. We literally need to stop doing these things. And we need to understand that this is chasing a Ponzi scheme. 
we need to start asking ourselves different questions. One of the, uh, oh yeah, if you look at this, build it and they will come. Like I said, this is, this is a mentality that's come out of our pursuit of growth. This is not how people historically built places. Do you recognize this street? This is my hometown in 1870. Uh, you can see, you know, you've got a billiard hall here. That's a restaurant. I'm sure there was a brothel up the street somewhere. You know, this is a little lumberjack town in the middle of the North Woods, right? This is the same street we were looking at earlier. 30 years of earlier. 1870, 1900. There were no huge build it and they will come investments. What it was was a lot of people doing small increments of investment over a very broad scale. Our cities and the traditional development pattern has a natural maturing mechanism to it, a mechanism that encourages small incremental investments over a broad framework. And you can see a city like this can start out as a bunch of little shacks in 30 years grow to be two or three story wooden structures. And 40 years after this, those wooden structures become granite and brick facades. That's the same exact street. No big transformative investment, no huge outside subsidy, just a lot of local people adding small increments of value steadily over time. We have that capacity in every one of our communities. If we're going to get there, uh, one of the things we've got to do is actually get in touch with what our real, uh, something we call the real return on investment. Um, if you look at the way we do projects today, uh, and, and anytime you see a federal project or a state project, we'll have numbers like this. Sometimes we put numbers like this to our local projects as well. Uh, but if you start looking in the paper, you'll see this all the time now. They'll report, we're going to spend a million dollars on this project. It's going to create jobs and increase tax base, and there's going to be $4 million of economic activity. Okay? And we look at that and we're like, wow, that's a no-brainer, right? We spend a million, we get four million. Why don't we do more of them? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a brilliant, brilliant project, right? The problem is, uh, where does this million dollars come from? A million dollars is taxpayer money. Where is that $4 million? That $4 million is private sector. We spend a million, we get $4 million of economic activity. Now, I'm a huge private sector guy. I actually think our private sector should be doing way, way more than what it's doing today. But this, as a math equation for local governments, does not work. It is really, really easy to create a project where you spend a million and there's $4 million of economic activity that happens. A much more difficult and a much more uh, challenging approach, and the one we actually can talk about is, how do we do a project that generates a million back? If we're gonna repeat this over and over and over, we have to measure the real return on investment, which is not how much economic activity we create, but how much <coughs> of that is actually recaptured by our local unit of government to do this trick again. This is something we never talk about. We never talk about. One of the other things we never talk about is the second life cycle. Now, when I went to engineering school, we had a classmate had taken engineering economics. And engineering economics, brilliant course. Uh, they do this thing called present, present value uh, analyses where you take two or three different projects and you look at them over their entire life cycle and you bring all that back into what presently would be worth and then you compare them. So in other words, if you're gonna spend a if you're going to spend a dollar 10 years from now, that has a different value than spending a dollar today, right? So one of the things that comes up in these analysis is something called the salvage value. It's the idea that you would go build a project, you would have initial building costs, then every year you would have annual maintenance costs, and then at the end, you would be able to go out and salvage what's left and sell that off for materials or reuse it somewhere, and it would have a salvage value. And when you take all of those and you bring it up into present word, then you can compare different alternatives. It's all a very, very logical approach. If you're Walmart, because Walmart is financed over a 12 year period, isn't that what our guy told us at the assessors conference? When they build a new Walmart store, they sit down and they say, okay, in 12 years, uh, we have to have recouped our capital costs. 
And so they go in and they do all the analysis and they figure out the cash flows and you know how much capacity the store will have and how much product it will move and then they pay off all the costs in 12 years. And then at the end of 12 years, they look at it for salvage value. Do we stay in this location or do we move to a different location? And if we move to a different location, we take the salvageable things, the shelving, the registers, you know, the toilets, I don't know what, and take those and put them in a different Walmart store somewhere and then board it up. And that is a successful transaction if you're Walmart. It doesn't work if you're a city. It doesn't work if you're a government. Because we don't get to decide at the end of 20 years that, you know what, that overpass didn't really work out for us anymore. Uh, we're just going to salvage that. <laughs> We'll use that somewhere else. You know, that subdivision didn't really work out. Sorry, we're going to dig up your pipe and we're going to salvage that on the other side of town where it makes more sense now. You know, we have this obligation to maintain this stuff on and on and on and on. So when we're doing a project, you know, we go out and we put together a project. Oh, I got to change that. That's our, that's our state flag. I got to get it. <laughs> we got to get it. Um, when we go out and we put a project together, we say, you know, what's the federal money that we can get for this project? What's the state money that we can get? Uh, what do we get from the private sector? And then what is our contribution as a local unit of government, right? And the best engineers, the best planners, the best city managers uh, are the ones that can tap into all these funds and make a project happen. <coughs> the problem is when we get to the second life cycle, we actually have to go out and fix something. We find that you know the federal government's not interested in fixing that block. The state's not going to come in and you know repair that sidewalk. The private sector doesn't want to put a brand new pipe in when their toilet flushes and their water faucet runs. And so what you're left with is Mary Quigley. You know you're left with us. We have to pay for that. So understand what you're looking at here. If you're putting a project together, and the second you know. You, it, and, and you're expecting to induce new growth, you're expecting to have new things happen because of this project, the cash stream from that new stuff that happens has to be sufficient by the, by the time you gotta rebuild it to actually make up for all of those outside sources of revenue. Because when you get to the second life cycle, it's just us. Now, Joe is gonna come up and talk to you about what I think is the most important thing uh, that we can do, and that is actually uh, improve the productivity of our places. Um, our web address, strongtowns.org, we do a blog three days a week, we do a podcast once a week, we do a video once a week. Uh, we also have a social network we started at strongtowns.net for people that are interested in working on these things. Uh, as was mentioned at the beginning, I did bring some books if you're interested. Uh, these are uh, the book we put out last year. We're just trying to cover our costs, so they're 10 bucks each. Uh, I've got a handful of them here if you're interested. Thank you very much. I started my life, this is how I started, right? My head, hair, 
and I was three months old, and this is what I'm going to become, right? So I'll become my grandfather. <laughs> and, and we know this with our families. We, we look at our the, the, the people older than us, and we see lessons in them. We see things that work and things that didn't work. We try to correct the things that didn't work, and we try to grow in the stuff that does work. More importantly, I look at this guy here. You can tell from my accent I'm not a native North Carolinian, even though I live in Asheville. Um, I am Italian. So I have two genetic issues. I'm genetically Italian, and we have a genetic predisposition to heart disease. I will have a heart attack before the time I'm 60. It's been in every single Minicozzi man in my family. Now, even though I have that destiny, what can I do to, to prolong that? Well, I could eat right, I could lower my stress, I could exercise. I have to do all of those things in order, in order to have longevity. My father's now doing them after he had his six bypass heart surgery. So this is gonna be in my life. Your city will have a, a death or a life, depending on how you look at it, how you're looking into the future. So what we're here to do is talk about some of those examples. I'm putting mine up front in my presentation. So let's go through a little test on why this is important. You know, oftentimes, did anybody, anybody ever see me do this one? Okay, if you did, don't tell out the answer. Um, I'm going to give you five seconds to tell me how many shapes you see in this next image. Right, so give you five seconds, it's just a kid's puzzle. I want you to just count the shapes and tell me how many shapes you see. Ready? Go. All right, who's got, who's got a number? How many? Those are two bats. Those five seconds. Forty. 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 Twelve. Seven. Seven. Eight. Eight. Seventeen. All right. How many kids were on the school bus? Anyone? 35. <laughs> <laughs> what time was it on the clock? See, there's five kids on the school bus, it's 10 after 10. You know, our brains work in funny ways. We have, we have it's, it, unfortunately, it's a very lazy way of thinking. We try to cut out other information and go just what the question is. You know, how do we have new growth? Or are you thinking of the maintenance? Are you thinking of the cost? Are you thinking of what's going to happen in the future? Are you putting that against all the data that's in front of you? And oftentimes, or far too many times, we don't. We go for the quick fix, we go for the fast answer. And I just tricked you into that. It's the power of asking questions. What Chuck and I do is we ask maybe different questions than our peers do. So again, this is another tool that you all can arm yourselves with. The questions you ask of your community are very powerful. Are you collecting all of the data? So y'all know where <coughs> Asheville is. I mean, I guess y'all have been to Asheville. Anybody not been to Asheville? Thank you, thank you for that. <laughs> um, here's where we are, this is how we started. This is a shot down Main Street, similar to what Chuck's talking about. From here, 30 years later, y'all probably stood in this spot. 30 years later, this is what it became. And um, we like to say the three T's made Asheville, trains drew them and tuberculosis. Um, once the trains got out there, brought all the people up into the mountains for the clean air, and we grew it. So this is a shot in, in, in town in the, in the 20, we had the second streetcar line in the entire country. Presidents came to visit, presidents still come to visit. We've had Obama three times. He really likes our barbecue. Um, I can't say that in Lexington. Mm -hmm. I can't say. Um, during the 1920s, we grew by 20% in population every year throughout the decade. Asheville was actually the second largest city in North Carolina. The only city bigger than Asheville at that time was Winston-Salem. We were bigger <laughs> than Charlotte. Um, we achieved the highest debt per capita in the entire United States. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then when the, when the Depression hit, we thought we had $5 million. Is there a mayor in here, elected officials? No. <laughs> when, when, when our books were audited, we thought we had $5 million in the bank. It turned out we had $18,000 in the bank. The city council was indicted, and the mayor committed suicide. That's how we entered the Depression in Asheville. Okay? <laughs> this is what uh, Thomas Wolfe, famous uh, Ashevillian, this is what he had to say about his hometown. Asheville has squandered fabulous sums. They've flung away the earnings of a lifetime. They've mortgaged those of a generation to come. They have ruined a city, and in doing so, they've ruined themselves, their children, and their children's children. That's the name of names in the community. Yeah. His second book was called You Can't Go Home Again, by the way. <laughs> For obvious reasons. But he was, in a way, he was, not that he was clairvoyant, but he nailed it. This damaged our city for a number of decades. We went off to pay that debt off. It took us from 1930 to 1976. Part of the reason why you see a lot of buildings in downtown is we were too poor to tear them down. 
So, but when we did get on that deck, what did we start taking advantage of? We started building highways, we cut the Crosstown Expressway through town, which became I-240, and the crew de Gras to downtown was when we blew Boatcatcher Mountain open and made the Boatcatcher cut, and the mall had <coughs> on the other side, and our downtown died. Sound familiar? This happened in city after city after city across the country. So these are shots of downtown Asheville. Um, this is from the 90s right here. Anybody go to downtown Asheville in the 90s or you remember it? You can shoot a bowling ball off down there. And it's a great redevelopment opportunity. If you want to invest some money in the downtown Asheville with this. <coughs> That's the Grove Arcade. So we had all these buildings just boarded up sitting there, fallow, for decades. Um, our answer was aluminum. We just covered up the buildings and forgot about them because no one wants to be downtown. So these are some shots more of downtown. And I mean, the pedestrian is a canary in the coal mine for a thriving city. If you don't have people walking around, you don't need a, a professional to save your downtown's debt. You can just see it right there. So, like a Greek choir, these people would show up that would try to do something, and, and the, 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 the community would rise up and say, that'll never work here, don't even try it. We've been down that path. It's not going to work here. We, we can't do downtown again. And they just had no confidence. In a way, that was Thomas Wolfe's legacy coming back, these children's children. So some people did try, actually, Julian is from Greensboro. He started our real estate development company. I work with a real estate development company called Public Interest Projects. Um, my, my consulting company is like a spin-off of it. But basically, 75% of our, our money goes into the sticks and bricks. We fix buildings, and we reserve 25% to seed businesses. So we find entrepreneurs like the Laughing Seed. Uh, the Laughing Seed came to us because they couldn't get a bank loan. They were vegetarians, they went to the bank, they wanted to go to a vegetarian restaurant, the banks asked them where their barbecue was. This is North Carolina, you're gonna have some pork on there. And they said that your business model would never work. They shoot them away. We financed them, they bought our loan out of us. We're no longer tied to them. And there are successful businesses in downtown. Uh, we a nightclub, Orange Peel. It's about having that stuff on the street, having active streets. We really care more about just having people living downtown and having businesses downtown. But other people are doing that investment. So this is one of our buildings before, this is it after. Now let's go back to the power of the question. These are four to 600 square foot units in the downtown. Who in this room would live in a four to 600 square foot unit? Three people? Let me change the question. Who in this room has lived in a four to 600 square foot unit? You know, that's, that's what we did. We basically just asked the question about, there's surely we're 83,000 people, there's gotta be 20, we've got 26 units. There's got to be 26 people who are either recently graduated, recently to town, recently divorced, want to downsize, we don't care. We just thought about the diversity of our community, and it's been 99% leased up ever since. A developer would call it so home run, and we nailed it. So the other thing that was interesting about Julian, he published his own newspaper, and in his newspaper, by the way, this is what Asheville looked like back at the time. Um, this is a great quote that I pulled out of this article about community occurrence. Among cities with no particular recreational appeal, those that have preserved their past continue to enjoy tourism. Those that haven't receive almost no tourism at all. Tourism simply doesn't go to a city that's lost its soul. This is a quote from Arthur Frommer. Fifteen years after he published this, Frommer's magazine was listed as the number five place in the country to visit. Now, it's not that Julian was a huge civic booster on tourism. He actually didn't care about tourism. He cared mostly about the architecture. He was trying to reinstill a faith in, in the town that we hadn't had for generations. So what we're seeing and experiencing from a real estate perspective, our downtown is worth $100 million. By filling up those buildings that we had just sitting there, that's these first two steps. We started getting new buildings in 2008. So that all of this wealth was sitting in our community. We just weren't tapping it properly. We had all these empty buildings just sitting there. Y'all follow me? So that's, that's our portfolio of downtown. It's worth, now it's worth close to a billion dollars. So what I want to talk about, though, is come back into the numbers of the day. And I like to use this Reagan chart about explaining it. We're ult ultimately, the two of us are explaining public policy, but coming to it from two different ways. And I love this chart from Ronald Reagan where he's talking about taxes. And there's our bill, and there's their bill. Does he even bother putting numbers on it? No. <laughs> but it's just sometimes just be simple about it. Just, you're going to make some money here and you're not there, so it's trying to get you to see the money in all of this. So what I'm gonna to try to do is maybe change or reframe the way that we look at cities to more the way a farmer looks at land. 
Farmers look at land on a per acre basis. How, much, how many acres of farm do they have? How many acres of fertilizer do they put in it? How many acres of, of water? And how much the crop yield per acre? Right? It's all just a mathematical model of a farmer. They don't just go out and farm the entire farm. They'll farm what they can efficiently handle from an economic standpoint. So if we do the same with cities, this is one of our buildings. <coughs> Crowds Ferry Retail, second floor office, upper stories residential. When we fixed this crop, we took it from $300,000 of value to $11 million of value. That brought a community wealth of 3,500% return on our work. So the community can now afford 3,500% more stuff, right? So we were paying taxes on this before, and now we're paying taxes on that. We pay $60,000 a year to the county, and $40,000 a year to the city in taxes with our buildings. And we want that investment in our community to have more stuff for our community. So let's put it a different way. How does this building fit in with, let's say, a Walmart, where this is my house, this is my wife Caroline, these are my dogs, my dogs are a little strange, I think they're lions. <laughs> they are really strange, by the way, they're like robots. But when people see this Walmart, they'll focus on that $20 million worth of community investment. How can my little house stack up on this? Well, first of all, we have to find a way to normalize it. So if I look at my house, Caroline and I pay $2,000 in taxes for a tenth of an acre. If you took a one acre cookie cutter and dropped it into my neighborhood, it's producing, it pulls out $20,000 an acre in taxes, right? Y'all follow me? So 2,000 times 10. If you take that same one acre cookie cutter and drop it into Walmart and chop its tax bill down to, in acres, it's producing 6,500 an acre. If you take that same acre and drop it on our building downtown, it's $634,000 an acre. That's the cash flow that's coming out of these buildings from a per acre basis. So what I'm trying to do is normalize these things on the unit of land. I was in California last month, and I wanted to make it really simple for the Californians to understand this. And I said, look, y'all, if you only had an acre to grow something, what would you grow? Wheat, soybeans, or marijuana? And they got the joke. Let's, let's go ahead and probably say, you know what, Joe? That's not fair. You've got retail taxes. So that's where moved me. And again, the misnomer is we focus on the big number. We focus on this wonderful $77 million. Well, that's the actual transactions. The city only gets a portion of a portion of that. And by the way, I'll have this all in a PDF so you can have it. Um, this is when we were getting 27 cents return to cities. It's actually down to what? In Asheville, we're down to about 9%. I don't know what your numbers are here from retail tax, sales tax returns. But burning the numbers at 27% on the, on the dollar, so that's the eight cent sales tax, the city gets 27% of that. So we get about 47,000 an acre. So the total taxes per acre, retail plus property tax to the city is $51,000 an acre. This is just the property taxes per acre out of our building. You got the retail taxes, you're cooking with gas, jobs per acre. So you just get more stuff and less space. And this is the efficiency that we learned over hundreds and actually thousands of years. You know, this, this is an L rolled up. We even had residential per acre in our building that they don't have there. You just get more stuff in this space. One of my friends calls this the money ball shot of, of city development. Y'all, who's read the book Money Ball? More people should read it. It's an awesome book. You don't have to be a baseball fan. It's more about business. What I'm doing is I'm using the numbers that are already there that we're not looking at. So another way of looking at it, and looking at, let's just look at the counties take on it. So here's the Buncombe County, my uh, county's tax yield. And county taxes per acre, it's the average county resident pays $1,200 to the county, a city resident pays 1700 bucks. So one of the things we first noticed is the city residents pay more county taxes than the county resident. It's because inside the municipality, the land is worth more than outside the municipality. So you're inherently paying more county taxes than your county brother and sister further out. We like to pick on the Biltmore State too, with their lovely tax subsidy they get. You bring commercial into it, and you see how why someone would do the mall at eight thousand dollars an acre in county taxes versus residential in blue. This is where you start to see an upswing in commercial gains. So what we do with our community in the, in the spirit of Julian with public education is we say, well, let's not stop there. Let's bring downtown into it. Here's the mall at eight thousand dollars an acre. This is our building at two hundred fifty thousand an acre. This is a four-story building at 45,000 an acre. It's, it's really simple, folks. When you start to stack up your stories, you're stacking up your dollar bills in the same place. Every story pays a new tax. 
So you're yielding more money on the land. Does that make sense? So this isn't scary math that either of us are doing. I don't have a degree in finance. I like to draw pictures, actually. But I just use the simple analysis or analytic techniques by asking a different question. So what I'm really trying to get to here, actually both of us are trying to get to here, is that the power of your government and your community is in your hands. If you look up incorporation in the, in the Webster's Dictionary, it says incorporation is the forming of a new corporation. A corporation may be a business, it's a business, a nonprofit, a sports club, or a government of a new city or town. This is the dictionary. So your elected officials are essentially on the board of directors for a corporation, and the citizen is a shareholder in two of them. And I don't only have the conversation with, with Burlington, but I have the conversation with Alamance County as well. What's good for downtown Burlington is incredible for Alamance County. So you're just dealing with a boundary of land that's just a huge real estate portfolio. Asheville's downtown is worth a billion dollars. My city as a total is worth $10 billion. Donald Trump's portfolio is worth $3 billion. So Asheville's three Donalds, if you want to look at it that way. And it's my city investigating the costs and the revenues and how that real estate development works. So knowing where the money comes from is kind of the important thing, and this is what we kind of get into. But if, if I were to build this godforsaken place in Arizona somewhere, when, when I build it, I think of all the hard costs and soft costs that go into this, and I turn around and divide it by the rooftops. When the government gets this thing plugged down the street, do they do the same thing? Do they figure out how much it costs on police, fire, sewer, parks, whatever? And the answer is no. And Chuck, that Chuck's the one gets into most of this that I see nationally, but not a lot of people get into that. We just basically send out an assessor and they figure out what the average value is or something like that. And you tax on value, not on cost. You get it? And if I sold, if I sold anything, if I sold this remote control without putting the price of the plastic into it, would that be a good business model? I just went out and said, oh, somebody just tell me what this is worth and pay a portion of that. That's how we run cities. And I'm not the first person to ask this question. It actually started in 1973 with Richard Nixon. He produced this document called The Cost of Sprawl, where they're trying to figure out the land use effect of real estate development patterns and what it means at the local government level. And there's some great stuff in there. It gets a little weird. It's 1973. They get into the emotional cost of sprawl. But generally, the numbers <laughs> Are kind of are, are, are good at the 75% of the document. It was updated in the year 2000 by Rutgers University, and they figured out the cost of a of government for 24 million households um, over the next 25 years. We start adding all these people, and if y'all want to give yourself a brain hemorrhage, please read this document. It took me forever. It's like 700 pages. There wasn't a damn picture in the whole thing. I had to make this chart. <laughs> and I made this chart just to try to figure out whether I got the document. And I was like, this doesn't look right. So here's the cost, uncontrolled growth. If we grow the same way we did for the past 30 years, or if we do a little bit of smart growth in 30% of the market, because not everybody wants it. So just a little bit of smart growth, these are your savings. And when I got done with this, I was like, that doesn't look right. I mean, it's still billions of dollars, but that's nothing, right? Who owns a business here? Sir, does, does this look any little weird, weird about this to you? Um, I was, well, the, um, the green is exactly the same there. Um, and what have you done with as far as? The well, that, this is smart growth, and this is regular conventional growth. This is the savings of smart growth. But, but look at this. If this is your revenue, and this is your cost, how long would you stay in business? Nothing. Yeah, so I called up the researcher. I was like, clearly I didn't get this right. There's no way government would be in business. What's going on here with this close to 30% gap? And he's like, what? Because it's all made up with permits and fees. You know, so this is the new growth thing. That if you have to have new growth in order to see this gap or fill the gap, 30% of the revenue. So what happens when we have a recession when the music stops and there's not enough chairs? Or in this case, we build too many chairs. Now all of a sudden we can't afford the government that we promised ourselves. We've made way too many commitments in cost or provide cost of services and we don't have enough revenue stream coming into it. And that's, that's the simple graphic of showing it. He actually agreed with me. Dr. Bushnell's like, yeah, you got it. That's exactly right. Now I was thinking, well, there's got to be a revenue neutral way of making this. But if, by the way, if, you're not, if there's a city manager in here, if you have any kind of 
There's a German word called schadenfreude, which is finding pleasure in other people's pain. If you want to get excited, go on a broken budgets, or actually just look up Stockton, California. It's one of my favorites. There's, there's many cities that have experienced a bigger crash than anything in North Carolina. So we were doing a study in Sarasota, Florida, and we thought, well, we did their ski slope for their chart, and here's their residential, here's their commercial, here's their bad mall. The bad mall got killed by the good mall. The good mall's the new one. So it's double the value of the bad mall. But ignoring these bottom two bars, check this out. This building right here is four times the production of the good mall, and it's not even occupied on the second floor. But they just spent some, I mean, heck, you could just write them a grant for $50,000 to fix the windows, and you could pump this thing over $100,000 an acre. Figure out where you can put your fertilizer if you're going to put it anywhere and understand what you're going to get out of your return on that. Do you all follow me? So we decided, well, let's, go, let's just try to rethink government. Let's do this revenue neutral model and see if it pays for itself. So the state actually did this document where they costed out different land use patterns. And this is, these are real places from downtown Orlando to Wellington, Florida. Wellington's in Palm Beach County. And you see as you spread people out and do lower density, the cost per unit of dwelling goes up. And it's real simple. If you have a mile of pipe with five people on it, it's a mile divided by five. If you have a mile of pipe with 5,000 people on it, it's a mile divided by 5,000. So the cost of services is less, the denser you get. So we took two of those because we were seeing those same patterns in Sarasota. And we said, let's take the multifamily residential and compare it against multifamily downtown on a unit per unit basis. So we'll take 357 units out there and we'll just run them against what's going on downtown and keep them separate. So this is the land cost for the same number of units. You can fit the same number of people on one-tenth the land area, so one-tenth of your corporation gets consumed. It costs you 57% to service them in the downtown pattern versus the suburban pattern, yet you make 830% more money. And if, and if we were to keep the budget separate, so every bean were to know in its own pot, how long would it take Let's say this is my mortgage and this is Chuck's mortgage. That's my annual payment and that's Chuck's annual payment. It'll take me 42 years to pay out versus Chuck at three. Now in the real estate development world, when I know my cost, my income, my time, I can figure out my ROI, my return on that investment. So it's an 18% return on investment in the, in the urban pattern. It's a 2% return on investment in the birds. Now when I was presenting this in Idaho and I'm like, Jello. There's way too many bar charts, way too much stuff going on. We're, we're sitting for cowboys, just one chart. So one chart, in 20 years, after year 20, they've made $34 million off the downtown, over their note, they're still in the hole five million bucks in the birds. And again, we don't see this in the budgets because it's always just one huge <coughs> service cost. It's just engineering or police. We don't see where that is. We don't geospatially understand that. But the land use effect is still there. Go back to Nixon. They understood that. So <clears throat> I'd like to quote Chief Justice Brandeis. This is the humble, the relentless, relentless rules of humble arithmetic. If you just follow the math, it will help you find where the problems are and how to fix them. So we've done this all across the country, mashing it up for every dollar of county taxes, a county single family dweller paying to the county prayer, a city resident's paying about eight bucks in county taxes. Walmart's somewhere around seven bucks, the mall's at 14, and as soon as you start stacking your stories, you start stacking your dollar bills. And it's not proportional, it's exponential. So what I'm doing here is I'm trying to reframe the way that we talk about efficiency in land. And we do this already all around us, we do this with our cars. When we talk about cars, we don't talk about them in a miles per tank basis, do we? If we did, we'd all be driving Ford F-150s at 650 miles per tank. Mm -hmm. But instead we do it on a miles per gallon basis. It's that that's the consumable object inside the car that we, that we pump in it every day. So when I say miles per gallon, the numbers change. I didn't change the cars, right? And we should all be driving BMW Assetas at 70 miles per gallon, <coughs> 1955 technology. It's being cute, a joke here, but not, <laughs> I've never seen a, an acre of land cost less than a gallon of gas. And if we're measuring efficiency on something that's $4, shouldn't we be doing it for something that's $40,000? So that's kind of one of the things that we're trying to do as a lesson here, is understand that model. So <clears throat> let's kind of close it with, with here. Um, this is, the, this is the, the region that Mark's group covers. 
And when we first got into this, I was like, oh, that's huge. That's a massive area. So we've got Winston-Salem, Greensboro, y'all are right here at the, under the D in Durham. So <laughs> let's look at this in a different area. <laughs> I didn't mean that that way, but yeah. Um, so if we're to say that this is like, let's say, up in New York or something, it's basically the land area from Lake Ontario to the Pennsylvania border that, that you all would have to contend with. Or if we're in Connecticut, it'd basically be the, the entire state of Connecticut that's in your land area. This is a tremendously huge region we're dealing with. And you all are just one town inside that. So if you stretch the fill out, when people think, oh, I'll just live in Burlington and commute to Winston-Salem, well, that's like commuting across Connecticut for your job. It's insane. So let's see, I went ahead and just uh, dropped it over Europe as well. It's like, <laughs> it's like half the size of Switzerland. It's like almost as big as Belgium or half of Denmark. I mean, it's a really huge area, so I'm just going to go a little bit. Um, so cities in North Carolina are kind of interesting, especially up in this area. This is a pretty powerful little region. So Winston-Salem's like a gross domestic product. If you were, if you were to make the city as a gross domestic product, you see what the big behemoth is at $116 billion worth of gross domestic product in, in Charlotte. If you took the top 13 cities, they would equal up 87% of the state's total economy. So we like to think of our state as being very rural, but the reality of it is it's very much driven by cities. Um, and so you've got three of them that are pretty powerful, side by side by side. You've got Winston Salem, Greensboro, and Burlington. So Burlington's about a 4.4, probably around a $5 billion GDP coming out of this little town, which is really. So. Going back to the region, I'm not going to go into these maps. I'm going to fly through these maps, but we made a value per acre map, kind of like the, the bar chart um, for the region. And you can kind of see the hot spots, which is land is over $10 million an acre. You see a bunch of that in Greensboro. Here's what's the Salem. Here's, hit, here's High Point. And y'all are these spots coming over here. So um, you can see it here. There's Burlington. Right there. Kind of zoom in. Even closer. This is getting good. So you see some purple when you get into downtown on Church Street here. That's over six million dollars an acre in, in your downtown. There's a couple of other odd spot purples. I don't. We haven't figured out where they are. Like that one there, and that one there, and then here's all high forties, generally in the middle range. And through here, but I'll, I'll come into it with a different with a different imagery. So let's go through Burlington. Um, in your downtown. Uh, this is where is that? This is Maine here, right? Uh, spring. Spring. Here's the right right? And uh, so, so right along Main Street, you're getting buildings that are over six million dollars an acre. And we made a three-dimensional model of the thing. And I'll leave this for you in Google Earth. It's kind of fun. Wait, can y'all tell me where downtown is? <laughs> there it is, right here. So one of the things we wanted to see is, is get you to understand the, very, the value dis distance of having that powerful real estate investment. Because this is, you're getting, on a per acre basis, this is the percentage of what, how people are paying their taxes on a per acre basis, right? Do y'all follow me? Is this too dorky? I've got this in Google Earth, we can spin around with it. <laughs> um, the other thing about downtown is we tend to, be aware of how much non-taxable land is near downtown and keep a healthy balance. Um, this is about what we see in a lot of North Carolina cities. Concord, or Con yeah, yeah, Concord is probably the ones that's got the most non-taxable. But um, just pay attention to this. This is, this is your most healthy garden soil and you've got to be aware that this stuff doesn't pay taxes. It has jobs there. Um, so let's run through a couple of examples. So the, the, the JNR um, outlet thing and the Burlington cofactor, co this whole thing here, it's pulling about $300,000 an acre of tax of, of value. Incidentally, this is a, a, the dirt under my house is producing more revenue than this. My house is worth $300,000 an acre. Um, this is Holy Hill Mall at a little bit of a couple thousand dollars more an acre. Um, Walmart's 
Now you're talking three times the value per acre at 600,000. Low is at around 600,000 an acre. Um, you get an Alamance crossing that goes up to $900,000 an acre. And what's interesting about this, just, I don't know what the issues are with, with Polio. Oh, Polio, sorry. Missed an L there. Um, but basically it's, it's what is this, uh, 1,000, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6,000 feet away. And you just shifted your retail, essentially. You know, but still it's, so this one, you've cannibalized that in the process. When you get near downtown, you're starting in the millions of dollars per acre. So we're, we're around 2.6 million. Um, the old Alamance Hotel, and this is a subsidized housing, and it's still pulling $4 million a day for a value. So um, I, think, I think that one might be, or this one's wrong. I took the wrong picture here. But 123 and 143 Davis is producing about six million. Um, this is what the old J.C. Penney is producing $12 million an acre of value. You get into the headquarters producing about 16 million. And this is great, for about $15 million an acre out of this. So 15 times the value per acre of uh, Elmont's crossing. So running through your chart, this is it. This is just your county's taxes, your county's tax yield per acre. I didn't do the cities. Um, so when I said that what's good for the downtown is great for the city, it's incredible for the county. This, I want to show you this. Is there county officials in here at all? You should love this thing. Um, so this, you get about $1,000 an acre out of JR uh, Burlington. Um, Holly, Holly Hill, you're getting 1000 the average county single family dwelling unit is paying about $1,000 in county taxes per acre, while the city residents paying about $1,500 an acre. Um, Lowe's at around $2,000, Walmart's at $2,300, Alamance Crossing bumps up to $3,000, let's say $3,400 an acre. Wells Fargo's at $9,000 an acre, 111 Maple, uh, 123, 143 Davis is 23000 let's say 22000 44,000, well, I guess y'all can read this, but here's the lab, lab court headquarters that are around $60,000 an acre in county taxes. We, we saw the average that I did earlier. This is the average sample set for your county. So for every dollar in county taxes the county gets, the city dwelling is paying on average about $1.40 in county taxes per acre. The Walmart's doubling that money the mall's tripling it, and then you get to a three-story building in downtown Burlington and it bumps up to $20 an acre in county taxes. And $49,000, or $49 an acre in, in uh, six-story buildings. Um, across the entire region, this is what it looks like. So to put them side by side, y'all are actually tracking pretty well with the other cities. You're just a hair under with the average for the whole entire Connecticut size region, <coughs> which isn't so bad. So um, I was expecting this to be a little bit lower. So you can see just follow these. So it's $1.58 is what the average city residents pay. And this is what Greensboro and Winston Salem's run into it. It's super high value. Um, so you're at about $1.40. So you're, about, you're tracking 10 cents an acre less, basically. So how do I convey this message in an apples to apples way? Well, this is Alamance Crossing at about a million dollars an acre. And these two buildings right here produce around $3 million an acre. So three times the value per acre of that. Um, if you had seven acres of this building, it would equal the entire 96 acre of that. Did I get that? So how many acres of this, this value would equal that value? Or how many acres of this would equal the Holly Hill Mall. So one acre of that building, one acre of that building would equal the entire 40 acre mall. So when you shift your retail, you actually have a sucking sound behind it of something that's producing low value that has high infrastructure costs around it. And that's what you get there. If you had if you had six acres of this building, it would equal the entire 96 acre of that building. And what's crazy about six, six acres of this, this building has a legacy to it. It's been in your community since 1929. Think about that. 
the few, the, the, your past generations have rewarded your community with an ongoing wealth. This thing has been a high producer for as close to 100 years. Is, how, how old is Holly Hill Mall? Is that 100 years? And it's already tapped out. You've got to scrape it down and get some more value back into it. The same will be true for all the new forms of development. This model that we've been on is a model of very shallow return. And this is a lesson for something to think, think bigger. So what we're trying to do here is get y'all to think like farmers. When farmers, when farmers farm a crop, they actually they have this term called precision agriculture, where they program the tractors to put fertilizer and water only where it needs to be. Do the same with your investments. Understand your community in a precise way. So I love this cartoon from 19, 1932 from a kid's book on city planning. V is for value, not measured in wealth. Funders think wisely, weigh in comfort and health. Think about the value of your community and where to put it. <coughs> your return on investment. So when you think about these things and think about these buildings, follow them through. Now, I've been dealing with like, you know, I'm a, I'm a downtowner of Asheville, which has a completely different downtown aspect to it. When I came here, I guess I uh, two different, three different trips now. Now, I mean, you have something great that we don't have. You have a major employer downtown. But what I wrestle with is where's that, where's that retail vitality that usually comes along with that? And it is something to deal with. It's, not, it's your community, you have to talk it through. But I wonder if you've got all this employment, where are all the restaurants and everything that usually comes along with it? And I don't know what the answer is there. But what's nice about this is this is a huge portfolio. They have $26 million worth of real estate in your community. So this is, is anybody from Lamport here? Yeah, so it's, it's how can you capitalize on this investment? You're not gonna do the restaurants. You know, our residents don't wanna do the restaurants, but can you find local entrepreneurs to fill those brown stories? Because that rising tax <coughs> raises all those. And you're paying a tremendous amount of taxes, too. So other things that we're thinking about is there's uh, type, townhouse typologies that we're seeing in the center part of the state here. Um, these are all, we were just in Charlotte a few weeks ago. <coughs> and we pulled these townhouses. And in this study, we found this one in Greensboro. So these higher, uh, higher density urban dwelling, what we did in our downtown in Asheville is we tried to get as many people living downtown those people drove the restaurants at night when the businesses were gone, basically. But that's $4 million an acre of value on the south side of, of Greensboro. It's a tremendous amount of capital return. That's four times the value of, uh, of Alamance Crossing. So I'm gonna close with some, some things that you've discovered inside of a lot of these studies and what we do as real estate developers, oftentimes unconsciously, that my peers follow a behavior pattern in economics and they're there are things laid out there that give me rewards in real estate development. And it's not, this isn't a, a, a recent phenomenon that in England you were taxed on the number of windows you have. So the more windows you have, <laughs> the higher your shilling rate. So what people did after that, for 100 years, that was the tax system. We knew the joker who put it in place, King William III. And they got rid of it because people started boarding up their windows to avoid taxes. In France, you were taxed below your roof line. So this architect, Francois Mansart, came up with this crafty way of sticking stories up in a roof, hence the term Mansart roof, and that was a tax loophole, spread like wildfire through Paris. The, the folks that, <coughs> again, you should thank LabCorp for making an investment in downtown and not going out into the burbs. The folks that invest in the downtowns are working against a lot of policies. Is there a tax assessor in the audience, or? Okay, great. Um, <laughs> When we do these maps, and we'll have a set of these for y'all as well, you've got two values in dirt, you've got your, or your buildings, you've got your value of your dirt and your value of your building on top of that dirt, right? So we can go in with the computer and take the value of the building off and just look at the dirt value on a per acre basis. So this is what the map looks like. And so from a low value of dirt per acre to a high value of dirt per acre. And y'all expect the world to look like this. Everybody in the neighborhood has the same value per acre of dirt, right? Well, look what's going on here. Where that person right there is paying 35,000 an acre, and everybody across the street is paying 15,000 an acre of value. So I was, this was in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and I was talking with them, and I was like, hey y'all, what's going on here? $15,000 an acre, and as soon as you cross the street, it goes up to $35,000 an acre. And the tax assessor raises her hand. And she's like, you don't understand. And I said, what don't understand? She goes, well, the more land you have, the lower the per acre value. I was like, really? So if I've got more land, if I've got three quarters of a mile of road, three quarters of a mile of road, and a half mile, half mile, you're gonna let me pay less taxes? 
than all my peers around me, or if you have a quarter of an acre site or an eighth of an acre site, you're gonna pay six times what they're paying per acre? And she's like, yeah, yeah, that's our standard. I'm like, standard? Is this a law? She's like, no, no, it's a standard. I'm like, where'd you get the standard? Did Moses deliver it to you? Can you get rid of it? I mean, is it really a law? This is every city's practicing this. These are the standards that reward me to go to your edge of your community where the land is cheaper, where I can buy more of it, and I pay less taxes in the process. Even better if I build a really, really cheap building, and I pay even less taxes. You get it? So understand that's going on. I've seen examples all over the country. This is in Chattanooga. What's going on here, where on this side of the street it's $20,000 an acre, on this side of the street it's $200,000 an acre, and there's no zoning difference, there's no school district difference. So basically the dirt under that house is worth 145,000 an acre. You cross the street and the dirt under that house is worth 30, 36,000 an acre. So these aren't invisible market forces that are driving me to make these decisions. Now these are market forces that are built into policies and behavior patterns that we need to understand, the questions we need to ask. So, we do have this unintended consequences to a lot of policies that we're dealing with. And that's all we're trying to do with this presentation is help you explore <coughs> those and understand those and ask different questions and understand your landscape. So thank you. I wasn't too dorky, was it? We've got a, we've got a lot of, sir? I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, the vertical construction, the models you're talking about, the numbers, they, uh, your accountant there, the, either the structure parking costs or the surface lot costs into that? If it's attached, those numbers. if it's attached or connected, in the case of Asheville, we don't have any parking in any of our units. And people park in a public facility. But they pay for it, and that, that note and that bond is paid for. Now I guess you could probably follow that and say, well, it's a public facility, doesn't pay taxes. But for the most part, it's you leave it up to the consumer. If they want to have a car, they go make a deal with the city and buy a monthly pass. Um, but they're actually paying for that space. Um, they're going to pay for it one way or the other. If we put it into our building, we're going to turn around and take that $18,000 construction cost and dump it into their unit cost. But we'd rather let them solve it. If they have a car, if they don't have a car, if they want to have four cars, does that make sense? Yeah, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, you're looking at everything per acre. And uh, yeah, I think vertical, obviously, you're making some good points there. You could do vertical construction anywhere within the city, and it's going to be, it's going to generate more value per acre. I guess what I'm saying is for a surface lot, even though that supports a vertical structure, uh, there's going to be very minimal uh, value for that lot. And probably most times, cities are going to lose, lose yeah. that deal. Um, there's got to be a, a breaking point somewhere where the vertical construction has to generate X amount of surface lots, or uh, you, you see what I'm saying? Well, in the case of the Lab Park headquarters, there's a surface parking lot that's city-owned, right adjacent to it, which is technically a loss. You know, that's the lost opportunity in, in, in physical development. Um, it's not paying taxes, but by the same token, <coughs> it's right next to it is paying a super high, second highest taxpayer per acre in the entire, <coughs> the entire city. So you're getting a high yield out of that, maybe that washes it. But again, it's just getting people to go through the go through the math first is, is the first step. A lot of times people don't ask those questions. Well, another way to look at that is your surface parking lot that's right, right next to that, or another way to say it, you just did, is it's, a, it's an opportunity cost. Because you haven't built a structured mm -hmm. lot, and if you had, you could reduce the size of the surface parking or the parking, and then build another building that also yields a very high yield right next to it. Um, and so you just have to, like I said, do the math. Yeah, it would just be neat to see those numbers with if those factors included, but uh, I think either way, the point he's making is vertical construction you know, generate more value per acre on it. That's, uh, I'm not arguing that at all. Joe, is it fair to say that your numbers usually include parking for a building because their parking is more often attached or not attached? <laughs> Or is that not? Is that not a pattern? If if it's a if it's part of it, you know, if, if I mean, lots of the buildings that we do is we go in and investigate by property owner, and then we do a second run by mailing address. Because sometimes, and we do this with our real estate, that parcel A is an incorporation 
XYZ partial B is in BC Z or whatever. But the mailing address is all the same. So we may own a surface parking lot that the buildings next to it is using it. So we try to do as much as possible. When I use those examples, we're doing a scan through the computer, and it's only so efficient. And you all need to understand, particularly in your downtown organization, you need to understand all of those parcels uh, and how they're working and how to, how to best see partnerships. Um, I'll show you one crazy example we did in Asheville. So we'll still get tax bases out of it. We've got a hotel and residential on it, but there's a public facility in it, and we all pay to use that parking. So any one of my residences that go into that will buy a monthly pass if they want to have a car. And, it, and it's going to finance its way out of that. So basically, the users will pay that cost. Um, we have actually have this other benefit called tourists. They come in and pay when they park as well. Uh, but basically, it's producing $57,000 in taxes to the city alone on that one acre site. It's not even halfway done. And that's a public parking facility producing tax base. Contrary to what you were showing us there, did you also look at the cost of services on the per acre business? I'm sure it would compound your numbers with not. So that was that uh, model that I showed from Sarasota. Um, Facility cost. That's the public facility cost for 357 units in the suburban pattern and for 357 units in the urban pattern. It's 57% of the cost. Mm -hmm. So the more you put people together, the less. It's a, it's a density thing. Yeah. And the other thing, how do you encourage people to mix use, to live where they're doing it? I mean, in Nashville, um, I lived there in the 90s. Nobody lived downtown. Nobody wanted to even go downtown. Um, how did, when did it start shifting that people wanted to have the small spaces, et cetera, located downtown because of the actors? It's kind of funny that you said that, because I was going to say the 80s. Now, there were people down there, you probably didn't mingle with them, but they were there. Um, mostly artists, um, single family, or uh, single individuals, people who didn't have kids. You know, I'll never, I'll never get my wife to live in this pattern. She doesn't want to. I'm not saying everybody has to, yeah. but providing that within the marketplace. Uh, in this case, I do think that there is a little bit of a build it and they will come. They're in your marketplace already, they just don't have that option. You know, or they're going to someplace like Greensboro or... Well, Greensboro's only started to build that option recently. Yeah. I mean, on a large scale, it's been there forever. Very particular about the downtown area. I live in Greensboro, but um, so you kind of take the bond area for downtown and see if they can take those those revenue, average revenue per acre, say like three store building homes, forecast what a revenue gap is really for like a downtown, you know, the opportunity cost that you're losing by not maximizing the use of those spaces for oh yeah for mixed use. I mean, even though Greensboro's had a lot of different stuff going on recently we still have a lot of parking as well. So there's what you're getting into is a is a system of thinking called um, uh, if you want to look up uh, there's a there's a tax theorist from uh, the late 1800s, his name is Henry George. Um, have y'all ever heard of Henry George or the George Tax Principles? Yeah. Um, Henry George actually, we talk about is not valuing buildings whatsoever because if you value buildings, you're gonna, you're gonna effectively penalize those that have a more valuable architecture. Now I'm an architect, <coughs> I, fixed, I fixed our house. We love our arts and crafts house. My tax value doubled because we fixed our house up. So we did the right thing, we fixed a, a building in the community, but we doubled our taxes. And I didn't double my wealth in the process, I didn't, I didn't double my cost, we didn't produce children by fixing the house, you know? So he was coming to the idea of there's that, plus there's speculation. That you can have somebody that sits on property in the downtown and holds everybody else hostage. 
And then they get rewarded when eventually everybody does the heavy lifting and picks up the value downtown. So um, he promoted this idea of land value taxation. And um, there's this great story. Elsie May Phillips was a Georgist. She was into that theory of thinking. And she wanted to promote it, but she realized she couldn't reach adults because adults are too set in their ways. So she invented a, a board game. That board game's called Monopoly. Y'all have played it. It's land value taxation. And the way you can win Monopoly is you assemble parcels and put buildings on the land. And then you can put somebody else out of the game. So she taught us all George's theory. We just don't practice it in the cities because of the politics. So anyway, that's just a fun little side lesson. Is it all politics or the demand of each community? In all due respect, Nashville is, is, is unique to the state in terms of what's downtown. I mean, one more what it's done. But you've got to have the drive or the, or the demand of your population to want that. In, in 1993, our city manager got fired 15 minutes after four people got swept into office. Those four people got swept into office because the city had adopted an urban strategy to fix its downtown. And the city went ahead and wastefully spent money on two streetscape projects, which is Haywood Street and Wall Street, and they built two parking decks. The city invested $26 million into their downtown that was worth $100 million. Four people got swept into office on this we're gonna teach them a lesson campaign. Uh, we call it the gang of four moment. They came in, they fired the city manager, they chased our downtown director around for close to seven years before she eventually resigned. That, 12, that $26 million investment in our community yielded a $500 million return on investment. So it wasn't all, it's still not all sunshine and glory in Asheville, but that was the children's children rising up and taking one more swipe at downtown. And so it's, you know, to think that Asheville is some happy-handed place of, 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 of wonderfulness, I, I invite you to come up to Asheville. And we've got our, the state stepping in and take our water system, without compensation. They took our airport without compensation. They've eliminated our ability to annex. They've eliminated our ETJ. Special state law is specifically for Asheville. So it's, we still have the politics. Well, some of the law is say why now. Really, it's an annexation. Uh, it's just no, no, you, we can't even, you can't even have voluntary annexation. Nothing. You're, we're fixed. We have no ETJ. But also, you had a land challenge issue in terms of, of, of what could be developed as a result of Part of it is not. Did you go out? We, our county barely has zoning. 86% of our county is zoned open zoning, which means you can do anything but a concrete plant and a asphalt plant. They're taking a water system and basically allowing developers to extend it, but the community has to cover the cost of it. And what's going to happen once you once you extend pipes? The only thing Asheville was not extending the pipes because they didn't want to see the growth go beyond its borders. They were, they're being fiscally responsible. And the other thing that they were thinking about is they didn't want to see that mountain landscape spoiled with rampant development. We call it the bumpy Charlotte model. Um, so just because we have verticality doesn't mean there's limitations. And besides that, we have intense unmet demand in our downtown. If there's a lot of buzz going on, I have people all the time tell me, well, if there were units, I would move down there. I'd move down there. What do you do? And I actually have people say, how are, the, how are those units going? I want to move down there. So um, we did a market study where we had 8% of 700 and something respondents say they would definitely move downtown. So that's, you know, 60 something units right off the bat. So, and that was on the definitely side. Let me take one step at that, that, that market thing too. Our project website for Keep Farm Together is tribesustainability.org. One of the other things that we've done, if we had another 45 minutes, we would be talking about market demand and the change in the demographics within the region. We did a, we had a housing market analysis for the entire region um, done, and this is some of the information from that. They looked at different surveys from around the South as well as from the National Board of Realtors. Both younger and aging populations are seeking more walkable communities. The house size is shrinking. One third of the local population uh, wants more compact housing. One third of the population favors rental housing now over owning their own home. The demand for multifamily housing is growing. Of the 140,000 more dwelling units that we're going to need within the region to accommodate, 
from the Ajax Road is projected that 70% of those need to be rental units. And that's because the younger generation is wanting something that is slightly different than what generations in the past. If we were also going to be talking about demographics, we'd be talking about 400,000 more people within the region. Practically 100% of that change is non-white. So there are a lot of changes within the market. I think this is the one time that planners and developers can actually be on the same page. Uh, because the market demand is wanting what I would say some people have, have thought and talked about for you know quite a while. So we've kept you, y'all have been extremely attentive. And when you get an attentive audience like that, you all you always get to stop because you think you could just pump a little bit more. But are there any other questions for Chuck or Joe? You can come up and interact them with them. One on one, or any kind of group question? I, I feel like just maybe at one more point about the downtown thing, because I, I do think it, it, there are so many incentives in place to encourage the style of development that we do today and to discourage people from building downtown. I'll give you just one off the top of my head. Uh, you know, if, if you want to get FHA backing, in other words, if you want to get, if you want to get a loan to build something downtown, uh, what's the ratio? You can't have more than 12% or 13% commercial within the building. So if you want to actually get something that w w can be s originated at a bank and sold on the secondary market, uh, you're not allowed to have a true mixed-use building. That old downtown that I showed you from 1900 in my city, it's essentially not financeable today in the national structure of financing that. So when we talk about the need to essentially add, you know, every time you add a second story, you're just printing money as a city. It is very, very difficult to do because the financial mechanisms underlying it are not there. If you want to build the standard commercial strip mall, you can get that financed. It can get sold off on the secondary market. It can get securitized, bought up by a Chinese pension fund, and you're in business. If you want to build a traditional Main Street building, it's really hard to do. So some of the stuff, we need to push back on here locally. We need to understand locally how we create wealth. Uh, but there's some changes that need to happen at the state level, at the federal level too, to make all this go. And so, you know, I think th there's, a, there's an aspect of it that has to happen here. There's an also an aspect of it that needs to happen nationwide. But Chuck, don't we forget <clears throat> that it's usually not legal in your city ordinances. Oh yeah. Two -story building. But I mean, that's the other thing is that, you know, the, the, to me, I walk out of here tonight, the first thing that I do, if I am you, is I look at my own code and say, what are the things that we've made illegal that shouldn't be? Because every city in this country practically has made the traditional downtown illegal, the surrounding neighborhoods that are walkable illegal. And we just, as a matter of course, made all of those things non-starters in our zoning code. So they're not financeable and they're not legal. That's why, if I'm gonna come to town and I'm a builder, I'm going to build what's legal and what's financeable. If you want to change that, we got to start changing uh, the incentive structure, and we got to start changing our own codes. So, thanks so much, Mark. Yeah. Well, thank y'all for being here. I hope you got something out of it, and I was really.